Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. This program brought to you in part by Selco. And welcome to the Reading for Life lecture based on the book Love in the Time of Cholera by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Reading for Life is a movement of the imagination with the purpose of growing community around a shared love of literature. The idea is that real community begins and ends with our imaginations and few resources, if any, are as vital to the imagination's development as works of literature. Our presenter tonight is Michael Verde. Michael graduated with honors from the University of Texas's Plan II Honors Program, earned an MA in Literary Studies from the University of Iowa, and an MA in Theology from the University of Durham, England, where he graduated at the top of his international class. He taught for 15 years at the university and college prep school levels, most recently at Indiana University, and is currently completing his PhD with a focus on literature and religion. Michael founded Reading for Life in 2005. Michael, we're on to lecture number four, Love in the Time of Cholera. So I'm going to pass it off to you. Great, Julie. Thank you. Uh, Steve, Linda, good to have you. And let's see what fun we can have trying to invite, invite this novel to reveal itself in some way that if we weren't collaborating, might not come to pass. So I'll just get us started a little bit where the book starts. Pentecost Sunday, the emphasis in the novel's beginning that it is Pentecost Sunday, it, it, it just keeps coming back that this is the day not only of Jeremiah de St. Amor's death, but also of uh, Dr. Arbino, Arbino's death, and then uh, the re return throughout the novel when Dr. Arbino's death is announced through the telling, the telling of the tolling of the bells, again, it's emphasized Pentecost Sunday. So I want to start just taking, I'm, I'm attending to the novel now that the Pentecost Sunday is not incidental. You can imagine having characters of this degree of import to the novel perish at any, any particular time it could have been, but to have two of your characters, one a, a principal minor character and one a main character to to die on Pentecost Sunday, it is that that kind of let's say underscoring of the image that I think invites engagement with it. So that's what I want to try to do. Just talk through a little bit of what makes Pentecost Sunday, I think, interesting as an image. So Pentecost Sunday, if, you know, it, for those of you who don't know, this is the day after Christ has returned, ascended, that the Spirit comes down comes down to the apostles and in the form of fire, and they begin to speak in tongues. It's associated with the Holy Spirit because it's thought that the way that the apostles and those participating in the Pentecost, the way they're understanding each other defies normal communication. They are speaking in a way that is something close to let's say, perfect understanding or telepathy. They're speaking in tongues that might not be decipherable through any human sort of recognition, and yet there is perfect understanding passing throughout the apostles and the people participating in such a way that they're, they're united in this kind of communion. You could just say it is an intense form of communion. But what's important here in terms of the image is that there is a fire that comes down that is not of the earth. And because of its contact with the people on earth, they are then able to communicate in a way that is supernatural. Often this image in the New Testament is contrasted with the Tower of Babel in the Old Testament, principally because of this relationship to speech. In the Tower of Babel, the idea is that man is going to ascend to God's throne and place himself on this throne. He's gonna usurp God. And he's going to sit in this throne and then, in a sense, become a god to himself. And this project is uh, 
uh, short-circuited by God by having the participants suddenly speak in different dialects so that none can understand one another. And that way the project is aborted. What makes these two images interesting is both kind of complementary with regards to speech, but also contrast is the, the opposite way in which something rises. With regards to the Tower of Babel, the initiative comes from the ego, from the human ego, and that is the impetus to ascend. At Pentecost, there is a descent that precedes the ascension, and that descent is initiated by God. In other words, the first movement is coming from heaven down as opposed from earth up. It is after this descent that the people on earth are then able through speech to transcend the natural world. Their, their ascent, in other words, has been in response to a descent. They're in a kind of dialogue now with the divine as opposed to being in a position of trying to usurp the divine. So with that, those images in mind, I want to try to connect to the novel in a couple of ways. And here I think is the, the a principal way into it is to think of the natural world is constituting some kind of limit. And then the, I don't want to say intrusion, I would say, I suppose the uh, intersection. Of, of, a, of a realm that is not of the earth. In other words, you have the natural world and then there is this intersection from another world that opens up possibilities that are not natural. In other words, there is the possibility here of rising above nature. And I want to suggest that that is an important idea if we're going to make sense of love. That there is something about love that defies the natural order. And I think we could think of this really in kind of bald evolutionary terms. According to evolution, it's the survival of the fittest and reproductive fitness that determines what it is that lives or dies. And the motive for change really has to do with this kind of cycle of life feeding on life. In other words, within the parameters of evolution, love makes no sense. There is something counter-evolutionary about the notion of love. You, when, you, when you look at, the, at a, you know, an explanation of evolution, what you won't find as a variable is something called love. That is unscientific. It's not reasonable. Scientists don't go to work factoring that in as a possibility. They're trying to make sense of what is or what is not without introducing this transcendent dimension, if you're following with me, within the terms of nature, love does not make any sense. Another way to say that is within the terms of nature, love is an illusion. And that brings us, I think, to the heart of the novel, because few themes are sounded more often and more deeply than the idea of what is illusory and what is dis uh, disillusionment. In other words, you had an illusion about something, but then you have a wake up call and all of a sudden that illusion is dispelled. The notion of illusion and disillusion, I, says, I want to throw in there, is somehow related to the question of, is love an illusion or is it a reality that is more real in some ways than nature? I want to throw that out there as the heart of the novel and suggest that often that kind of question, at least within a, let's say the Western world, often that question is associated with a form of salvation related to religion. I mean, if you think about, I grew up Southern Baptist, we were going to get born again. And then when our biological death ended, we were going to be somehow in heaven where we weren't going to die. We were going through the Jesus's intervention. And in other words, that is a typical kind of route to achieve a certain form of eternity that is typical and understandable in the Western world. And I want to throw out, I think, an idea that's not re really any objectionable is that that is not the route that this novel is proposing to eternity. This divine element seems to be very much located in a very natural love. In other words, it is the kind of real love between a man and a woman, in this case, that achieves the kind of eternity 
that the Western world typically associates with a divine being that is not human. If you want to make a comparison, you can think of the, the Middle Ages and the uh, courtly love and how Eros became, through the Greek tradition, Eros became something like a com competitor to agape love. So that you had these poets that were, uh, they had their muses who were the, the maidens who may or may not be their wives, who they devoted their lives to in total service, selflessness. And this became a route to salvation that in many ways, if not in every way, was competitive what, with what the church was proposing as the means to salvation. Because you could imagine the natural world and the spiritual world not combining. In other words, you could think of as one of the lovers say, this is Sarah Noriega to uh, Florentino, that it is physical love from the waist down and spiritual love from the waist up. That suggests a kind of division that I think this novel is challenging very directly that in fact the physical and the spiritual both have to be completely in play for it to be real love. Which makes the, the scenes at the end of the novel between Florentino and Fermina so very interesting because if the spiritual love and the physical love are going to have to unite, then the spiritual is cannot reject the body. The body and all of its decrepitude and let's say lack of what you would think of as a cosmopolitan magazine beauty. The, the, the description of their bodies when they come to, to make love with all of the reality that you would think would not be a part of a typical love story. Do you see what I mean? The, the, the body itself, these two lovers had to accept the reality of their aging bodies and incorporate that into their love and not separate it or deny it or to otherwise evade it. They had to bring the entire reality of nature, which includes death. That had to be included in their affirmation of love. That definitely makes the ending make more sense to me. And also some, like the, Florentino's whole, his whole arc of, you know, trying all these different kinds of love, that, that makes that all make a lot more sense for me. Wonderful, because we can think of, in a way, when she asks him, or it comes up, or he uh, uh, offers freely, I suppose, that he was a virgin, after we know that he's had like 622 lovers, and that's not including the ephemeral tryst, okay? He states that's not the one night, okay? And then he says that it, basically this is the first time he's made love. If we put these two together and think that heretofore, all of his love with these other women have been from the waist down, that there has been an element of his heart that has not participated in these other, let's say, amours or sexual intercourse or however you want to think of it, that there's been a part of his spirit that has actually has been reserved a fidelity, a new fidelity, as the, the boat is called. There's a part of him, you could say that the spiritual, that has never participated in all of those previous intercourses. And to that, in other words, I'm reversing this in a way to make it possible for Florentino to have said something possibly true. And when the ship captain asked him about, you know, but they want to go back and forth, back and forth, and how long could you do that? And he says forever. And the captain says, are you serious? And he says, I've never said, since the day I was born, I've never said anything that I didn't mean. Challenges us to say, in what sense could Florentino still have been faithful? Now, the point of that is not whether or not he's been faithful or not. That's not the point. The point that we're trying to move towards is, can the spiritual and the natural be wedded. And if we think of illusions and love, is it possible that love is an illusion that is more real than the reality of reason? I want to say that again because I do think this is the, the query of the, the novel. Is it possible that love is an illusion? 
that proves to be more real than reality as reason understands it. I'm really liking this concept of illusion versus disillusion. And, and I think that we could maybe even extend it, although they mean different things, but it could also extend to like what's real and unreal. And they're sort of, they sort of work not exactly on exact the same uh, plane, but they, they do relate. And I also think about this story was set 1875 to 18, or I'm sorry, 1875 to 1925. And I think about why did Marquez choose that time period? And to me, that's about, that's the, the pinnacle of Latin American colonial colonialism and that big changeover, revolutions everywhere. And, and there was this illusion of order and structure and whatnot. And then the disillusion is like, it was, it was disarray and revolution and you know, complete change and went from, from uh, Urbino's science view of the world and the things that are real to the art view of the world and what's not real. And that, that's all a illusion, disillusion, reality, unreality, that, that's all wrapped up in this story. So I really like that. Well, I want to say that I think that they're perfectly coincident. In other words, I think it's the same question. And so I think it's beautiful. And what you've said may, makes, makes me think, what are other elements in this novel that prove to be illusory mm -hmm. that would initially have presented itself as really the fundament of reality? So, for instance, you mentioned the entire social structure. Mm -hmm. This is the social structure that Dr. Obino gives his entire life to, he dedicates his life to these civic initiatives, to these scientific projects, et cetera, to, to detoxifying the, the cholera causing water. He, he invests his life in those things. And this novel, I think, raises the real possibility that compared to the love that Florentino and Fermina experience, everything that Dr. Obino invested in his life in is an illusion. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, would, I would also add in there the Catholic Church and the structures of the Catholic Church that the same, the same trajectory follows through this story. That's, that's why I mentioned the courtly love. This book, without ever saying so, mm -hmm. is, well, as he says about Jeremiah to say no more, he was a saint who was an atheist. Mm -hmm. Is there anything less likely, he says? And it turns out, I, I would propose, that Florentino is a saint of love who doesn't believe in God. It's very clear he doesn't believe in God. He says as much at the end there when he's trying to uh, find his virility, when his manhood is failing him on the moment of consummation, he prays. No, oh, excuse me. This is when he goes to meet Firmino and his stomach revolts on him and he has to abort early because he has this basically gets to the, the carriage or to the car. And it's he, you know, he. It was a, it was a, let's just call it what it is. He had a, a stomach issue that culminated in diarrhea, and he was going to pray that it didn't happen, but it occurred to him that he didn't believe in God, and he remembered some little kind of uh, ditty that you could say before you, in other words, he doesn't believe in God. This is a, it, what you just said, I'm saying that this book, without ever saying so, is saying, you know what, that entire superstructure that you fantasize that relates to some kind of divine being that sits on a throne is an illusion. But mm -hmm. this, what's happening between these two old people, that's real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's the line that it puts in the sand. This is, this mm -hmm. is an artist who is ultimately not really splitting eternity with the church. Yeah. Now, you could imagine people that understand Christianity in such a way where that's not offensive because they don't imagine that it has to be an either or kind of thing. They may understand, in other words, they may understand God as imminent, as transcendent, and in a very incarnational way, which includes every facet of the body. So I don't want to say that this novel is anti-Christian, uh, but it is very clearly anti-organized religion. Mm -hmm. And for the very reason I think that you just said, Steve, that it, it, it is not real. 
it, 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 it proves itself not real the way everything in this novel, I think, proves itself, whether it's real or not. And that is, does it have authority over death? In other words, death is an authority. Is there anything other than death that has greater authority? And I think this novel says, yes, there is one thing. There is true love and that it has authority over death. That this is the, the last authority. And then you could say, well, that's crazy. And I don't believe it. Well, that's great. You've made your, you've made your pick. You know what I mean? You, you, rejecting that is accepting something else, right? Because if you say, I don't believe any of that, I believe in science. Okay, well, that's what you've picked. And the question you're going to be facing, and this question all of us are facing is, what is the power of science in the face of death? And this novel answers it, I think, pretty clearly. Uh, it is impotent. And we're this Go ahead, Steve. Does that question come back to Urbino running up the ladder after that parrot? Well, there you go, because he was, just thinking of that is like yeah. he, re he reaches and reaches. He just keeps climbing and reaching for the next thing, the next beautiful thing. And in the end, that's an illusion and he falls and dies. There you go. And wouldn't that bring us back to the Tower of Babel? Mm -hmm. And wouldn't that have something to do with the fact that his last words to his wife was only God knows how much I loved you, yeah, yeah. which means he failed. Mm -hmm. there, was, it, there was something he did not communicate in the time that he was allotted. He failed, you could say. With regards to love, okay, I don't know about science or to his city, mm -hmm. but insofar as love has a kind of calling on us, he failed. And all of his wealth, all of the privilege, all of his intelligence, nevertheless, his, his fidelity to those things, including the social structure, as you pointed out, that was clearly exploited, his, his fidelity to all of that was a choice that he made that proved to, in the face of death, to be less powerful, let's say. And he still died. But can he, I, can I interject a question? Please. There? Please. In, in, okay, his last words were only God knows how much I loved you, but then Ramina also has regrets that she expresses that she wishes he could have kept him alive longer so that she, she could have expressed her own love for him. Mm, that's wonderful. So, so where's her, where does her failure fig, figure in to the whole picture? Because it takes okay. two. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. Uh, so let, I'm just going to, I don't know, that I'm going to throw my two bits at it and then you can tell me what you think. I think that this becomes one of the things that a person has to not look back towards if he or she is going to experience this transcendent love. In other words, looking back, including our failures, becomes one of the temptations, if you see what I mean. In other words, she has the temptation where I could re I could re regret this acknowledged. I wish I had it over to do over again. She could either stay in that cycle or she could let it go to the present moment. If you see what I mean, the past could either be a source of sabotage of something that transcends time if we don't let it go if you see what i mean that this becomes one of her temptations if we're going to think about the temptations of christ or the temptations that would keep you from eternity one of the temptations would be to look back do you see what i mean it doesn't mean that she has to pretend that she did it right or to deny it rather i see it and then i i have to let it go now this is a i think a big part of both of their lives of, and she's the one most insistent upon it really with regards to their earlier love affair why she says do you keep looking back to things that don't exist so in a sense i'm suggest i'm throwing out the possibility that hanging on even to our regrets can be a pitfall that that's one of the things we're going to have to let go of if we're going to experience this transcendent. In other words, if we're going to move into this domain, let's say the domain that death doesn't have the final authority over. One of the ways that we will be receptive and able to do that is that we would have let go 
even of those things. And imagine the regret of Florentino and the, the abuse and exploitation of America Vicuna. What he would have to let go of. If, if you see what I mean, that all of our past are going to be a potential impediment to experiencing the present without it being somehow um, compromised. And if we're gonna experience true ecstasy, then that means the things in the past are going to be, well, here's the best way to put it. Those things are not gonna pass through the fire. And that brings us back to Pentecost. This is the fire that burns up everything that is not love. This, and this is the, go ahead, Steve. So the way I understand Pentecost is it's the seventh Sunday after Passover. So it's seven weeks, for, it's 50 days, seven weeks plus one day, the seventh Sunday after Passover. And in Judaism and elsewhere, that's celebrated with a great feast. It's, it's when the first, the early wheat harvest comes in in the Middle East. And it's, it's like the big feast of the year. And so I think that it's also significant that what Linda just said is she has this regret, but then what does she do? And how does she behave? And do, you know, how does she, she change? The, and does she engage in a great feast? Well, that's a great way to put it. In other words, is it possible that we're reborn? Mm -hmm. And this is an emphasis of the novel, that, mm -hmm. that, that love, we have a death. This is why it's so much like cholera, right? It, love kills us in a way. But what it kills, you could say, is everything in us that's not love, which means we've got something that has been redeemed or saved from the fire, and we can go from there. I guess the in Judaism, it would be something like the Jubilee year mm -hmm. or of the forgiveness of all debts after, what is it, 50, 50 years is a Jubilee year? Maybe it's related to this notion, but in any case, it's the, it's the idea that after seven years, if you've been a slave, your, your debts are paid for. There's a kind of freedom, in other words, that's built into the, the Torah. Of, of freedom from debts. And I'm suggesting that that could be parallel to the possibility that we will have sinned in such a way that grace alone could give us another chance. If you and I guess I'm curious, Linda, what you think when Fermina expressed those regrets and what did she do with that? And does that relate to these themes? I'm, I'm curious what you think of that. Well, I guess I was just trying to sort out, you know, he he hadn't expressed his his love for her, although he had in, internally apparently felt that, but knew he had screwed up. And likewise, she felt the same. You know, she did move on. Um, it's just kind of, I, I was really just thinking in terms of their relationship, um, you know, what, what responsibility maybe is the word do each of us have in our relationships? You know, it's not all his fault. It's not all my fault, her fault, whatever, you know, it, it has to be coming both. It has to be going both ways. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and I guess maybe, you know, one of the other, um, thoughts I've had about this as you talk all the, you know, the, the theme of, you know, true love, you know, I guess we've maybe all experienced what we might have thought was true love. And we find out that it, it wasn't. <laughs> so it's an illusion. It's an illusion. And so where's, you know, I mean, it's that where's the, that's it, isn't it? You know, where, you know, it's a blessing to find that, that you can really feel confident that you can go up and down the river forever without, you know, any interference. Mm -hmm. um, but it is rare. I think it's rare. Right. Yeah. Maybe, you know, it's a good question. Is it real or not? Right. Uh, but I, I, what I want to say about there is um, the scene where she goes to the grave before she takes this trip with Florentino, she goes to and has a conversation with, with her husband. And so there is that. But then she does say, well, they're together. 
that it's interesting that you could look back and have thought all the time that it was love and discovered that it wasn't. So I think the novel makes it clear that they never really were, they never had love in the sense that Florentino and Fermina experience it. And it even says she got close to her 21st year and that was the deadline when she was gonna relinquish herself to fate. And we had learned just before that, that her father came to her and said, we're ruined. Uh, so I think the novel does suggest that there was a kind of expediency uh, in her situation that may have not, not that she was being manipulative, uh, but here I am, what am I going to do? Um, in any case, I think the, the bigger question that relates to your comment that it's really got me thinking here is, can this thing we're calling love, can it actually cleanse us, so to speak, or can we be reborn from all of the things we've done in the past that we would think would disqualify us from that experience. In other words, it is it, because this novel is really preoccupied with looking back and the burden of memory and the way that memory can sabotage the possibility of a present. In fact, one of the comment that she wasn't going to stew in that maggot broth of, of memory. This was uh, Jeremiah St. Amour's lover when she learns of his death how it's over with, and, and Dr. Urbino can't understand it, right? He can't understand how this woman, which I think indicates he really didn't get love. He didn't really get love. Her love for him and her love for her life, her love for love in a way, he just really, because it didn't make sense in a way. So I'm, I'm just saying that I think a, a theme here is, is it that our past can disqualify us from a new birth? Or is it possible that this love truly is supernatural, even to the point of giving, giving us a second birth or a third birth or a fourth birth? That in some ways, you can't say this is compared to the past because this is another dimension of existence altogether. This is new. This is new because we're in a new dimension. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but I think the novel puts it out there in front of us. Well, and does it does it kind of exclude the youth from true love then? Do you have to go through these things multiple oh, okay, times so, to, yeah. you know, go through the fire to refine yourselves so that does it exclude then true love from? Yeah, wonderful. I, I think that's wonderful. And, my, and I don't know the answer, but I'm going to throw two bits in here that Florentino's love was not an illusion. And the proof of it was the rest of his life. Now, for Fermina, when she says it was all an illusion, because that's what she tells him when she comes back after they've agreed to be married, she sees him again and all she instantly knows. I think for her, that was absolutely right. In other words, she actually was being completely honest, which explains how it is that she could ever find him again because of her commitment to reality. And I would want to say that these two characters are very much associated with, in the case of Fermina, reality. Every sort of image relates to nature, her disinterest in fashionable things, her not buying into the social structure. She is grounded in reality that is unusual. So for her, I think when she says it was illusion that that was absolutely true. But my thought is that the novel reveals that for Florentino, it wasn't an illusion. Go ahead. I, I, I wonder, I'm trying to think about this and I'm not sure I'm clear on it, but how many of these relationships is one of the characters living the illusion of love and the other one's not? Help me understand that. Tell me what you mean. So for instance, uh, with Florentino, he, she, she has been disillusioned, but he now has the illusion of love. And before that, it was the opposite. She would had the illusion of love and then found out it wasn't real with, with Urbino. I mean, is, is there some part of this that like people move in different directions at different times? And is there a piece of it that in a relationship, one person may be with an illusion and the other person is not living with that same illusion? Well, I think it's a wonderful question. What, what, what do you think? Uh, and I, I mean, I think it's a wonderful question, and I'm asking myself right now, can I think of any of the relationships that Florentino has that would give us some kind of precedence for understanding this? And 
there is a, this weird comment where he realizes at some point in his life that he could have multiple lovers and love them all the same and be equally faithful. I mean, there are things in this novel that cut against every grain of anything that you would think of as acceptable. Mm -hmm. And there's this wonderful line that you, he says that one thing is the case that nobody teaches life anything, which seems to suggest, I think, that life is far more complicated, ambiguous, contradictory, and even unacceptable to any social structure that you can imagine whatever social structure, there will still be a sub, what does he call it, their secret life? And isn't this what Fermina discovers after her husband's died, even affairs that potentially that she didn't know about? And remember at one point he decides not to even ask her if she ever had any affair, but he had wise enough to know that anything that men were doing, women could have done as well. So I think the novel holds out, there is a secret life that consciousness almost can't bear acknowledging and that we either participate in it or we don't because I think in a way, Dr. Obino really doesn't participate in it very deeply, which is why he's completely blown away that Jeremiah St. Amour had a secret lover and why that discombobulated him so much. I thought that was for me. I had, you know, several times, I'm, why is this discombobulating him so much that this guy had a secret lover? And I think it suggests the sort of superficial depth at which he actually was related to the human being, let's say from the waist down. That he really, there was a sense in which he, all his commitment to science wasn't taking him very deep when it came to things uh, uh, related to love. So anyway, um, I, I don't have an answer to that except to say maybe every possible permutation, Steve, is part of the mix. We've been using the terms illusion and disillusion, and I wonder if we should be actually using uh, illusion and science or illusion and real. So to, what, there must be something behind that thought. So what's... Well, I think... Uh, Dr. Urbino, he dealt in the real world and was with science and learning and knowledge and that kind of thing. And he didn't buy into the love and that. And to him, that was an illusion. But then in the end, maybe he had them backwards. I and think with, and yeah. with the other guy, he was doing the opposite. He was like the artist. And, you know, uh, all, everything was illusion. And, and, you know, there was no sense of real and whatnot. He couldn't then, even write a business letter, for instance. No, he couldn't do. And then in the end, did he kind of flip flop too? I mean, I think that's exactly it, Steve. I think that's exactly it. If you're going to say, where do you stand on this? I would say in my, my two bits unambiguously that Dr. Obino lived an illusion and Florentino not only didn't live an illusion, he lived a life that bore fruit in the form of this novel itself. In other words, there's two sort of parallel tracks going on. This is a relationship between Florentino and Fermina, but there is also this very important, not even subtext, you could just say parallel text, of the power of language to communicate this love. And think about the moment whenever she, when, he, when her husband's dead, at the time of the funeral, he comes and professes his undying love to her. She's in an absolute rage. She says she never wants to see him again and sends him, a, sends him a letter basically to go F off. And he took it as his great opportunity for which he has heretofore lived his life because this letter was warranting a response. And all of his reading, all of his love letter writing, all of his commitment to literature was now about to either pay off because he was going to be able to respond in a way that was going to win her heart or he was going to fail. If you see what I mean, if this is a story of a kind of night of love and there is something that he has to slay, he's going to slay it with his pen or in this case, the typewriter. And one of the things that he emphasizes is that he has to, he has to have her understand that love is the alpha and omega, that it is not a means to anything, that it, this is the novel, that love is an end in itself. Because if she can believe that, then she has an opportunity for a new life. 
if you see it on me, her husband's gone. What is her future going to look like? Is she's got X number of years left? Is she going to, you know, here she's in a position of a widow. Is that it? Or is there a possibility, in other words, of another life that she's not too old for, that she's in no way disqualified for? And the only way she is going to take a step towards that idea is if she's convinced of it. And the only way she can be convinced of it is through his words, if you see what I mean. So I'm, I'm suggesting that there's a kind of proof here. If we have a hypothesis, which of these two is illusory and real, I'm proffering the idea that the novel says that this love is real and that the proof of it is this novel itself. That it itself would have to be to us like the letter was to Fermina, if you see what I mean. That love is not believable, but you read this novel and you start to think, well, maybe it is believable. Do you see what I mean? That, that maybe the evidence, in other words, is in the language. So, and that this so is, is, a, is there ahead. an underlying question in this novel that really the whole book could be summed up as what's real and what is unreal and how do you tell the difference? I think so. And the, I would add one thing to it. And the, and the test is fire. Mm -hmm. And isn't this, this, this is, goes right to the heart of Western intellectual and imaginative tradition, isn't it? That gold is what passes through the fire. Mm -hmm. And this, this brings us to another dimension of just the crown, because the crown, or like the halo, represents some kind of light or transcendent light that we imagine comes from, and he, he calls her the crown goddess. Mm -hmm. In other words, is it possible, in other words, that our body is a kind of receptacle of this thing called love that reason will never understand, but that it proves itself in the pudding? In other words, that it doesn't have to always be a hypothesis, that if you act on this, you will have affirmation because you will experience it. Now, you couldn't prove somebody without experiencing it, if you see what I mean, but if you experience it, you won't have any doubt which of which is illusion or what is not illusion. In other words, at the end of the novel, I don't believe Fermina has any doubts about whether this is real with Florentino or not. So just a Go. quick question about um, Florentino's journey then, you know, during that period where he was experiencing every possible permutation combination of love and, and you know, physical love, was he at the same time it, perhaps testing it, you know, with the idea that perhaps he would, you know, maybe there's another true love possibility out there since Fermina's taken with the, you know, married, not available, you know? He, he, he proposes different sort of reasons. One, that he is uh, trying to satisfy himself. He just like, it's like, Matt, he said, sort of, Medi he's kind of medicating himself. That's one possibility. One is physical, just taking care of his physical needs. He's just trying to not feel pain. He mm -hmm. is he substitute he's substituting this for something. He says that, and he also says at one point that he believed that, that, that this the idea that as long as you were still sort of if you use it, you won't lose it. So that this was actually a way that he would be prepared. I mean, he says as much that as long as you could still, you know, he, I think he's given himself all kinds of reasons why. But one thing that comes to mind when you say that is, I think he's learning. That I think this is part of his tutelage. This is his apprenticeship. He is learning about things that Dr. Obino didn't even imagine existed. Do you see what I mean? These very, what you might think of from a certain perspective is these strange sexual uh, perversions, if you want to call them, you know, and it's a book is really, I think, wonderful in the way that it captures these different ways that people make love and kind of ways that make you go, oh, God, I don't know if I can read that. And then you go, oh, I can't pretend that I've never imagined something that crazy. Any case, I think, in other words, that he is learning something about this underground world, if we want to call it that. He's learning something about depths of human nature that the social structure Steve referred to simply does not allow us to acknowledge out loud. So why does he have to go through all of that? You know, you, you know he's learning about human nature. He's learning about his own nature. Um, 
and and it's all like I say, it feels like it's the waiting period, you know, since you find out at the end that he does get together with Hermina. It's like the it's like the hero's journey in some ways in a real way. Absolutely. Weird I think it's exactly like that. This is the hero's journey. If you imagine instead of someone trying to be a saint related to organized religion for Christ, this is someone who's a saint for what we would think of as eros or carnal love. And that they absolutely, I mean, how many ways is he compared to a rabbi, to hermeticism, to some kind of, of Spartan existence? He lives like a monk doesn't he? I mean, in all ways, he has paired it like the Apostle Paul. Do you throw off all the things that encumber you and run the race before you? He has denuded himself of virtually everything that's an impediment and not related to Fermina. He has shed every illusion. There, I think that is right, that he, he has shed everything that is not in the service of this love and the question of why he has to do it well i don't know that is a great question but i would think that all of that tutelage let's call it uh prepared him to write the letter that he said all of his life he was waiting for this opportunity in other words what he was going to put on when he sat down with that typewriter what was going to come out of that was going to be influenced by every single thing that he experienced and then she perceived in that a degree of wisdom and i'm not certain that she would have had that experience had him been has been as juvenile as juvenile urbino do you see what i mean or if he had just been sending her another poem from his earlier life yeah there you, you go know, in their earlier part of their relation he he had been through all these other experiences which provided him with the the depth to be able to go there that he Wonderful. wouldn't have had had everything just gone smooth for them from the start that seems exactly right to me that he would not have grown had he not had all of the, including all the bad things you could imagine maybe even including america vacuna i don't know but i, I do want to just throw out the idea like what you're saying that it was those experiences that led to the difference between what she perceived in his letters. Mm -hmm. And likewise, she grew through the experiences that she had so that she was ready for him. I would agree. And also that she was partly instructing him. Mm -hmm. I mean, her grounding in reality was partly crucial to his letting go. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That she ended up being an important instructor to even her, her rejection of everything that struck that had a scent because her her gift was the nose every scent of nostalgia she rejected as a loser so i'm going to agree with you that she was absolutely having her own buildings roman or educate it was the sentimental education i think is flaubert's term for it it's just or perhaps it's rousseau but it's the education of love that this is the education of love and that they had different trajectory, educational trajectories, understandably coming from different places in the world. And if I were to throw my two bits at what hers had to do with, it had partly had to do with rage, particularly at a patriarchal world that had subordinated her in every turn, that there was a kind of built-in rage that could itself have been an impediment to her experience in love, had she not gotten through that rage, in other words. And the novel, I mean, this is so brilliant when he suggested at the meet the rage was a feeling of guilt. That she felt if that she was to blame at something, she responded with this rage. And the novel makes very clear in, in the ending that that sense of being guilty lifts from her and disappears. That she experiences a freedom, in other words, where she did no longer felt that she was to be blamed for any number of things. Do you see what I mean? There's a kind of existential guilt that she had come out on the other end of that I think was part of her educational trajectory. Steve, what do you Is got? that the moment she owns her reality and that the illusions have all been lifted? Well, I'd have to, I don't know. That's a great question. I'd have to go back and see if, it, if that moment is tied in in that way. But certainly uh, it enabled the two of them 
let's say, to go back and forth forever. In other words, I'm going to propose the novel suggests that they achieve eternity. That's the name of the town, La Dorada, Golden La Dorada. There's the gold. There's all kind of gold in this novel, but only one gold turns out to be real, and that's the gold the two of them bring up, like the sunken galleon, right? The real gold of that galleon. And we're just we're coming here to a close to add to our images of fire coming down and of a communication that transcends nature. We can't obviously walk away without thinking about the river. And here is a just a, an image of time, life flows, time flows. Ultimately, this is the river that you're either going to drown under or you're going to move across as in above it. In other words, when he finally tells her, take a boat, this is how this, this is how we're going to get across this river of death. It's this kind of love that's going to enable us not to sink. In other words, this is what you see the same thing in Gatsby when he gets on a nomadic mattress and he has a hydroplane. The novel puts this idea that there's a spirit on top of the water and that when we move on the spirit, we do not sink beneath the waves. If we don't move on that spirit, then what happens like Peter? We, we, we drown. If we move with the spirit, we walk on, we walk on water. And it, I wanna, it took oh. me a minute. It took me a minute, but I'm getting it. It's the river sticks and they're crossing to eternity together. I think absolutely. And I think absolutely. Captain, I think the captain is the ferryman and he gets awful interesting mythical mythological dimensions, doesn't he? At the end of the novel, the captain starts, things get very, very interesting at, at the end of the novel. And I, I would have to keep dealing with it. But one thought I've had here is that the captain may be the author. In other words, Marquez may be closer to the captain. And Florentino really might be the Holy Spirit. Because the, the most important moments, people recognize that in crucial moments, no pun intended, he speaks with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Everyone recognizes it. The captain at the end takes his command, so to speak, from Florentino. The guy lives kind of like a make-believe world, except in certain instances, he speaks with an authority that all of a sudden, and my thought is, okay, maybe Marquez isn't Florentino exactly, because whoever wrote this novel, so to speak, isn't Marquez exactly. If you see what I mean, if we're going to play with the idea that something divine comes to a writer, that enables him or her to speak with an authority that transcends even death, then that would suggest that who wrote this novel, we couldn't answer it with an ordinary who, if you see what I mean. That Marquez contributed to it, but something else came down, let's say, and added the fire or the wind that elevated it into another dimension that and that's and so i'm just saying that the ferryman here in a way might be the book itself that this is like the boat that can move on water and the proof of his entire life as an artist might be whether this floats or not if you see what i mean that his entire proof of whether he lived up to his calling has to do with this vessel right here and whether or not we move with this vessel may have something to do with our own reading. One of the things that, and we can close with this, Julie, one of the things that Fermina says to her son when he asks, how do you know this man? She says, he taught me to read. Now, that's not true because she was already teaching Scholastica in Latin. She was teaching her. But the answer she gives to her son is that he was teaching me to read suggests that there is a role to be played for the reader in this novel and learning how to read in such a way that you can hear that spirit moving through these letters. What does the, the epigraph say? The words I'm about to express they now have their own crown goddess. There you go. If there, I think, is someone saying that the Holy Spirit is about to move through these words. That's a pretty strong sort of uh, 
overture, I would say. But I want to thank uh, Linda and Steve and Julie. This is so much fun when you just get together and get, let the word get the book get a word in edgewise and then let our imaginations play around. Are they really we're just playing around with these words and letting something that none of us independently would have thought perhaps without each other. And I really think that indicates what kind of community can come to fruition in relationship with literature that might not with other kinds of things. You can imagine us sitting here to talk about politics or religion, and we might not arrive at some kind of collaborative effort where no one has to have the last word. We might find ourselves divided in certain kind of ways. So I do think that this conversation is a little bit of an example of how we can come together, set our egos aside, and learn from each other, both from our life experiences and our experiences with the work of art. So thank you guys for making this so much fun for me. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. And if you enjoyed this conversation, make sure you go to the Austin Public Library, APLMN.org, to check out the podcast that we did, um, to the two podcasts that are related to this book and the other lectures as well. So thank you very much. This program brought to you in part by Selco. Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.